Good evening, everyone who's joined for the information session this evening. We'll just wait a couple of minutes to admit uh, folks who are joining the meeting room now, and then we will start the information session. So talk to you very soon. So for those of you who've just joined the Zoom room, we're just letting folks into the room right now. There are 76 participants in the room. We had over 100 people register for the session today. So we'll wait just another minute to see if there are more people who will uh, be joining us, and then we will start the session for today. So just a reminder that this session is being recorded uh, to be shared with folks who are not able to attend today. And I just ask that for now, please mute uh, yourself um, to prevent uh, the interference on the audio. And we will have a question and answer session at the end uh, of, of the presentation so that you can unmute uh, then if you would like to ask any questions. All right, I think let's begin. Uh, welcome everybody to the information session. Yeah. Bless you. Organized by the New Canadian Centre. Um, uh, just a reminder for folks that uh, if you can please mute yourself so that your microphone is not on, that would be very helpful. And a reminder that this session is being recorded to share with folks who are not able to attend today. So this information session is focused on sharing um, local and federal responses to the war in Ukraine. My name is Yvonne Lai. I am the Director of Community Development at the New Canadian Centre. My colleague, Faye Tan, is the Settlement Services Coordinator and she will be joining me as a presenter today. Before we begin, uh, before we begin the information session today, I would like to start off with a land acknowledgement. The New Canadian Centre is located on Treaty 20 Michisagik territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagik and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausole, and Georgina Island First Nations. We respectfully acknowledge that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. I feel that today, uh, as we discuss our responses to the crisis in Ukraine, the question of land and who owns the land is especially important. So this is the agenda that we have for today's meeting. We'd like to share with you some information about what is the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel. Just bearing in mind that this is constantly evolving. We've received even more information today um, as, uh, as it's been shared by both the federal and provincial government as to what they're able to support with this authorization. Uh, we'd like to share how you can support Ukrainians who are currently abroad right now, how you can support them locally, and then we will end the session with the question and answer. So for now, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Faye Tan, uh, in order to 
share with you the information about the Canada-Ukraine authorization for emergency travel. Okay. Um, thank you, Yvonne. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Faye Tan, and I'm the Salmon Services Coordinator here at the New Canadian Centre. So today I'll be walking you through the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel Program, and basically what these entails for Ukrainian nationals who will be arriving here in Canada. So firstly, it is very important to know that this is a temporary residence program. So what does this mean? This means that Ukrainians who arrive in Canada are here on a temporary status. So they are either here with a visitor status, a work status, or student status. They are not considered permanent residents. The goal of these programs is so that Ukrainians can arrive in Canada quickly and safely without having to go through the tedious vetting process that is usually necessary for the refugee resettlement program. In other words, there is currently no pathway for Ukrainian nationals to arrive as refugees in Canada. So this CUAT um, application is basically a type of a visitor visa application. This allows the, vis the visa holder to come in and out of Canada for up to 10 years. It is an online application um, through the Immigration Canada website. The government has waived all the application fees, and it is also an application that is currently being prioritized with a processing time for about um, two weeks. So it is very fast. So um, with this visitor visa, Ukrainians can also apply for an open work permit. So what is an open work permit? So an open work permit basically allows um, a person to work with any employers. They are not tied to a specific job, to a specific company. So basically they can work anywhere to, with any employers. Um, as for students, uh, minors who are arriving um, can just attend elementary or high school right away without needing a study permit. For those who want to study at the post-secondary level, they will require a study permit and may also require to pay tuition. So all Ukrainians can stay in Canada for up to three years before needing to extend their stay. Should they decide in the future to live permanently in Canada, there are available pathways um, that are open to temporary residents to apply for permanent residency. So who can apply? So basically anyone who is a Ukrainian national and also their family members. So for family members is of any nationality. So if a Ukrainian is say married to a, um, a Romanian, they can all apply together as long as they can establish that um, relationship to show um, what, how, how they are related. And um, basically spouse, common law, partner, dependent child, are all considered family family members. Um, so the next thing is, uh, we would like to let you know that the new Canadian Centre staff can work with you and assist any of your family members, Ukrainian nationals, uh, basically who are here in Canada, we can work with you to uh, for the visitor visa application. If you have any questions of how to navigate that online, please reach out to us. Um, we can work you through the application step-by-step. Step. And we can also help you through the work permit, study permit. Yep. So um, we also get a lot of questions about private sponsorship of refugees. One thing to note that um, the CUAT uh, program is Again, it is not a private sponsorship of refugees. It is not a sponsorship program, okay? It is a temporary program. On a regular basis, the average processing time for private sponsorship is two months. So the Canadian government is making this really quick so that Ukrainians can arrive quickly without having to go through this tedious process. However, if you're still interested in privately sponsoring refugees, 
uh, from other countries, please feel free to reach out to us separately and we can have a conversation and I'll walk you through uh, what those options are and what the procedure is. Okay. Yeah. So what then does this all mean? Ukrainians will arrive in Canada as temporary residents and not as permanent residents. So what is the difference? So um, one of the main difference is, is that as a temporary resident, uh, Ukrainians will not qualify for monthly income support. So that means that they do not qualify for things like Ontario Works, ODSP. They do not receive a monthly stipend from uh, neither the provincial government or the federal government. They also, upon arrival, do not um, qualify for child tax benefits, do not qualify for OHIP, and also will not be eligible for OSAP. And this may also mean that if a Ukrainian wants to um, go to post-secondary education, they may be required to pay international student fees. And I think these are some of the important things to kind of take note of. So what then is available for Ukrainians? Um, again, as we've mentioned, um, they have an open work permit. So the moment they arrive with the open work permit, they can start working. Um, elementary, high school students can attend school right away. And um, there are also government funded English language training programs that um, Ukrainians are eligible for. So one thing that we may have heard is that um, Ukrainians may arrive in different with different levels of English proficiency. So um, this will be, um, so having these language training programs could definitely help um, with that. Um, they are also eligible to receive settlement services uh, from agencies such as the New Canadian Center. And so with us, um, basically we can help with things like school registration, connecting them with the community, um, making sure um, uh, there are plenty of um, uh, conversation groups, activities that they can, they can attend. We can help with job search, providing orientations on um, how life in Canada is, and also help with basically any kind of application or um, applying for any kind of identity document. Yeah. Thank you, Faye. So the next section here is related to support for Ukrainians uh, both locally and abroad. And this section has really been um, curated based on the kind of the kinds of uh, responses that we've received from the community immediately when the news about the war broke out. So we've received questions about how can we support Ukrainians when they're in Ukraine and when they're in other countries outside of Canada. So our response really is to share that you can donate to aid organizations, including the Canada Ukraine Foundation, to the Red Cross, UNICEF, UNHCR, and many other organizations that have well-established presence with regards to global aid. So some things that you may want to consider, these aid organizations are really saying that the capacity to process stuff is low at this point, and that the best thing to do if you want to um, help immediately is to donate money over stuff. Uh, they ask that you prioritize organizations that have strong existing ties to Ukraine already, um, to be aware of scams and that there are other creative ways to help. And some of you may have heard about um, folks who have been booking Airbnb rentals uh, in Ukraine to support those who have properties there. So how can you help Ukrainians locally? First and foremost, being kind. And I think you being here today expresses that you're part of that, uh, that movement. So being part of a welcoming community in Peterborough is really, really important. Uh, Faye had mentioned before that folks are able to apply for a work permit. Uh, Jobbank.ca has established a special page for jobs for Ukraine. If you are an employer or if you're in touch with someone who is able to offer a job, definitely please post on jobs for Ukraine. You can also send uh, our employment counselor at the New Canadian Centre, Olga Statsyuk, an email with your job posting so that she can also assist folks through the NCC. Her email address is olga, O-L-G-A, at nccpeterborough.ca. And I can share that in the chat later. From the camera. Thank you. 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 Th
You can also organize events that bring diverse people together that invite them into your group and support organizations and programs that prioritize inclusion and empowerment. Many of you have asked about volunteering. So the way that we will be helping them at the NCC is that um, training clients will first be meeting with staff to conduct a general needs assessment. What is it that the family needs right now in the medium term and in the long term? So in the short term, if they would like to have the support of local volunteers, what we will do is to match a team with the family the same way that we have with government assisted refugees. We build a team of volunteers who are able to assist um, with um, community orientation, with tutoring, um, all kinds of different ways to integrate in the community. So what you, would, you can do now if you are interested in volunteering is to fill out the volunteer application form on the NCC website, which is nccpeterborough.ca slash get dash involved slash volunteer. So a note here that volunteers will only be matched with families based on need. We're getting lots and lots of responses for volunteers, but if the families don't need them right away, um, our volunteer administrator may not be able to get back to you right away. So a note here that there is an ongoing team for support team volunteers to work with refugees from many countries. In fact, today we are, we are welcoming two families, um, two government assisted refugees families to our temporary housing. So if you sign up as a volunteer, please state that if you're open to working with all kinds of um, clients or only with displaced Ukrainians. Housing is something else that community members have been stepping forward to offer, that you are interested in offering temporary accommodation um, to um, a displaced Ukrainian family. So what we've been doing is compiling a list of your names and contact information if you are interested in providing temporary accommodation. So again, through that needs assessment process, our staff will meet with clients to assess their need. In some cases, they'll be staying with their families, so there is no need for accommodation. In some cases, arrangements have already been made for accommodation, so that may not be needed. So we'll match folks based on need, and we'll also encourage conversations between potential hosts and their families. So if this is something that you are interested in offering, um, things you may want to consider if you want to provide temporary accommodation is how long uh, are you? is this offer for? How many family members can you accommodate um, in your residence? Would you allow pets? Because we know that some people are traveling with pets. Uh, what would you include in your offer? Use of the kitchen, managing fridge and freezer space. Uh, do you intend to provide room and board or just accommodation? How will you communicate um, house rules? And if the family does not speak a lot of English, how would you propose as a method of communication uh, to resolve conflict and whether transportation is part of your offer as well? So these are things we'll reiterate um, to potential hosts if there is a need uh, to match the families. So um, as of two days ago, uh, we just launched our urgent appeal for the NCC Client Emergency Fund. So as you've heard, as you've heard from Faye early on, um, there is no resettlement funding because uh, displaced Ukrainians are not coming through the refugee resettlement pathway. So what we are seeing is an urgent need to have a fund that provides them with their most basic needs when they arrive. So every family will have different needs. There may be families that require medical treatment right away. There may be families that don't, that require uh, funds towards accommodation right away. So what we're hoping to do with the Client Emergency Fund is to be as responsive to the needs as possible through the needs assessment process uh, to establish, is it groceries that you need right away? Is it a combination of things? But then to be able to provide that financial assistance uh, to each family that is uh, as needed. So we've launched our campaign to raise $20,000 for this fund. That may evolve um, based on what is needed, but this is, the, this is the ask from our community for now. And the funds raised will go towards this client emergency fund to support those fleeing from Ukraine, as well as other newcomers in times of need. This emergency fund has been in place for many years at the NCC and really has been a big support towards basic needs like food, um, shelter, and medical treatments. So if you're interested in donating, you can um, donate online at the NCC website uh, or buy a check that's made out to the New Canadian Centre uh, with a tax receipt. 
So many of you have already contributed uh, to efforts towards this humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, and we're very, very grateful for that, whichever way that you have chosen to support. So at this point in the presentation, um, I did want to highlight that um, individual families are also being supported in their communities, whether by their workplaces, by their church groups, by their social and community groups, and by their neighbors. There's active fundraising that's already happened, and you may have seen in the news uh, GoFundMe pages that have been shared um, by families already. There is an active GoFundMe page for um, support for families in Northumberland. We know that there are 15 families that are coming to Port Hope, and this is a GoFundMe campaign that you could choose to support um, if that is if you would like your money to be directed specifically to families. And at this point uh, of the presentation, I wanted to have uh, the chance to introduce two families who are in Peterborough who have already received family members um, here and to invite them to share their experiences. So the first person that I would like to call upon is Irina Lositsia, and uh, she, with her husband Alex Goloborodko, um, and I will stop sharing my screen. Let's see if I can find Irina. Irina, yes, there you are, super. So, here you go. Irina, if you'd like to unmute, please go uh, ahead and share your screen. I did, I am mute. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I would like to say good evening to everyone. And uh, we are introducing our family together with my husband, <coughs> Alexander, and my name is Irina. Our family has its own uh, history of coming to Canada. My husband and I came to Canada in 2014 when uh, Russia invaded Crimea, which is a southern part of Ukraine. Before that, uh, we all had been living in Crimea for 17 years. And in the same 2014, the family of our daughter, Victoria, with two children also left Crimea. Um, however, they could not go to Canada then, since very soon <coughs> uh, Victoria was due to give birth to her third child. So they, their youngest son, Mykola, was born in the year of Russia's invasion of Crimea, 2014. After leaving Crimea, our daughter's family began their lives in another part of Ukraine. For the last two years, they lived in Kyiv, the capital city of Ukraine, uh, where they were caught by the war. They were able to leave, leave Kyiv uh, for the western part of Ukraine, then to Slovakia, and then to Poland. Uh, two children have already arrived here to us from Poland. It was uh, last Tuesday. Um, the rest of the family is waiting for the return of their passports uh, with visas from the Canadian consulate in Poland, and we hope they will arrive here soon. Uh, we are very grateful to the many people in Peterborough for their support uh, during this difficult time for us. I am fascinated by the help that has already been given to our grandchildren. They feel safe here. They feel support and love in Peterborough. They really want to continue their education. Our community has already organized a tour for them to the Adam Scott School. Uh, so they all already know uh, which school they will go to. Uh, I would like to say Canadian society has a particular mentality that encourages newcomers to, to look for a new life here. We are very grateful to each one of you for, for that. And I know that uh, our grandchildren have a couple of words to say on their own. If it is possible, 
I would like to invite the older Sofia and the youngest Alexandra for a couple words to be said. Go ahead. Uh, hello, I'm Sofia. Uh, I'm from Ukraine. Uh, it was like a nightmare being there. Uh, first, you run from the explosions uh, that are uh, heard very close. Uh, then you hide from uh, the war in different cities uh, where you wake up from the sounds of uh, air raids. I couldn't sleep there. I couldn't communicate with all my friends. It is such a contrast to be here where everything is calm, uh, where everyone uh, is uh, happy and smile. And uh, Sofia's brother, Alexandra, please come and say something. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Alex, uh, Sofia's brother. Um, we are glad to feel safe in Canada, uh, and we are extremely grateful for all these people in Peterborough. Um, it's um, um, very important for us to um, return to normal life and continue our study. Uh, we are uh, very grateful for this chance. Um, and we are worried about our little brother and parents who stay in Poland now. Thank you for letting us to speak. Thank, Thank you so much, Irina. So um, Irina's email address is shared in the PowerPoint. Um, I just also saw a note in the chat that um, I've, my volume is not uh, loud enough. I'm just sorry about that. I will try to speak up. Um, the, the next person that I would like to invite to speak is um, Olina Olinik. Olina's family has also just arrived uh, in Peterborough. Olina, if you're here, could you unmute so that I can see? Perfect. There you go. So, Olina, if you can um, take yourself off the mute, then you have the floor. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello, dear friends. I want to share a story of my daughter, your journey from Ukraine to Canada. My daughter and me planned her uh, trip to Canada last year. She get her visitor visa, but her children passport was in process. And we expected to get the visas in in few days, on in a week. And unexpected happened invasion Russia to Ukraine. Russia invaded Ukraine. It was a tragical and unprecedented action of Russian government. Uh, we didn't know what to do with this situation. I urged my daughter go to border as soon as possible, but she decided to stay there and uh, wait for the visa. It was very <laughs> very hard time because our city is located on the south part of Ukraine, very close to Crimea and Mariupol. And maybe short day of the war, it was invaded. My daughter called me when I was at work and told me, mother, take deep, deep breath. Uh, we call, we have tents in our city. It was, it was so hard to hear. The fighting continued for a couple of days and they stay in the dirty and the dark and cold basement of apartment building for a few, few nights. 
at day they come out to have some to eat and went back to basement. Kids were scared and my daughter was scared as well. In a few days, fighting came out of the city and the city was completely invaded by Russian troops. So we tried to find a way out. My daughter was strongly, this, this time she was strongly desired to leave the city because she knows that I were, was waiting for her and she get um, message from Ukrainian embassy that her children's document are ready. They said send a children's passport to us, but it was impossible because nothing worked that time. Store didn't work, brand didn't work, but offices didn't work as well. Uh, I asked my daughter to find some friends or some people who can help to take her to the Parisian city where was train station because in our city train station was bomb. It was impossible to leave uh, the city by train or bus or anything that car. Finally, she find people who give her right to the Parisian and my daughter and Three children took train to Polish border. I was at uh, work that time and opened my cell phone uh, during break and see my granddaughter text me, Babushka, my agent Polish. That means, Grandma, we going by train to Pol Poland. We went to Polish border and in 27 hours they finally reached this border. I prayed all the time and I asked my friends and co-workers prayed as well. I had to put from my <clears throat> hello to masters for my union at work in Applewood retirement residence. Also my friends uh, who I know from New Canadian Center, encourage me and um, give me support. So when train comes to Polish border, train stayed at the border for 20 hours. They check the documents. When uh, they finally reach a small city that's called Kong in uh, Poland, my daughter took the train to Warsaw because she needs to go to embassy to put the visa in his past. In this, in embassy was very long line. She was 130 person. She stayed for a few days. Uh, it, didn't, um, it was impossible to get in, uh, in person. So she sent her children's passport by um, grand career by mail and luckily she gets it in a few days like in three days after she sent she get it back after that we will was prepared to buy tickets our union helped help me to buy tickets because three tickets cost a lot it's uh, thirty six hundred dollars we didn't have so much money at the time. Uh, so I had support from my union and from my colleagues, to whom I very, very grateful and appreciate the help. Appreciate help of my colleagues, masters, from Peter Brothers masters, uh, my relatives, my friends, and community and New Canadian sent, especially because they send me message all the time and they give me advice. Also wanna say to our MP, Michelle Ferreri, because I connect to her as well. I, I'm grateful that my daughter and her children here, they come on Sunday night. They stay with me 
also, of course, we need some support still, but it's so nice to have them here and feel that we can have small talk, have dinner together, and enjoy our time, day time in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alina. So um, someone asked in the chat if the links for uh, the PowerPoint as well as the recording will be shared. Uh, yes, and uh, Irina and Olina have also consented to share their email addresses. Uh, the link for the GoFundMe campaign that's happening in Northumberland uh, is also in the PowerPoint as well. So this concludes the formal part of the presentation that we've prepared for you today. Um, I would like to now open the floor up to questions if you have them. And uh, you can uh, put your questions in the chat if you prefer or you can uh, raise your hand and uh, unmute to ask the questions. We have um, a significant number of people in the room and I can only see a, a few people on my screen at a time. So uh, if, you, if I don't see you, please put a message in the chat um, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, put the question through. So I see a hand up from Joe Holtram. Joe, please go ahead. Hi there. Um, thank you for putting this on. Uh, it was really informative so far. And I think, uh, I know for myself, seeing the people speak, especially the kids, it was very powerful. Um, it's really good that you guys are, are doing this. So thank you for that. Um, did, I was curious, did you invite any of our, uh, either our MP or our MPP to this information center session? So I have to say that the session was hastily pulled together. So it was a broad uh, media release that was sent out. Um, but it's a, it's a good reminder to send this recording to our MP and MPP um, as well for them to view. Uh, yeah, the reason I ask is because my original request and for information went through my uh, member of parliament's office and uh, they basically referred me to you guys to get some more information. So I've kind of been sending them emails back going like, should be the other way around. The new Canadian center in Peterborough should be the people getting help from you, not the other way around. So I would just like to point out if you have another one of these, I think an invite to the MP and the MPP would be wise and uh, might broaden, broaden your reach. And uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Joe. There is a question from uh, Kate in the chat that who has a family arriving on Tuesday with four children and whether they can be registered for school. So Kate, definitely please connect with our settlement team. Um, we have the settlement workers in schools who are going to be um, happy to help you with school registration as well as other orientation. Um, the person, you could go through KFA and I, um, so please send us an email, um, the email address I can put in the chat very shortly. Um, Ian has also shared in the chat that CBC has an article that gave a link to housing for Ukrainian refugees website to help link potential families to households around the world. Um, I have not seen this resource, Ian, so thank you for sharing that and we can make sure to include that in the PowerPoint that goes out. Uh, to everybody. Are there any other questions from people in the room right now who would like to ask them in person? Well, ask them, you know, by speaking as opposed to putting it in the chat. Uh, David, your hand is raised. Please go ahead. Hi, it's David Kane. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, David. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm with Safe Haven for Refugees, a volunteer group who's worked hard with the Syrian refugees, uh, and we always had a partner to issue tax receipts to make the fundraising easier. We've been reaching out to all kinds of organizations in southern Ontario to try to find a partner, and I didn't know if anyone else on the chat uh, had any ideas on finding a partner to issue tax receipts, which makes the fundraising maybe three times easier. 
And at this time, I, it doesn't look like churches and organizations are built to stand up to, to allow this, but I just uh, pinging the organization. And Faye, I want to thank you and your team for putting us on and the two guest speakers. Very informative. Thank you, David. David, could I suggest that you also put your contact information in the chat uh, if there are other folks on the call who would like to connect with you around this issue? I will do. Thank you, David. Um, I'm just going to jump into a question here from Chris. Uh, this might have been covered, but I would like to know how to make it known that we are willing to host Ukrainian families or individuals. So it was a slide that we had covered earlier on, Chris. So please send us an email at info at nccpeterborough.ca if you are interested in providing accommodation. What we're doing is gathering a list of uh, folks who are um, offering. Uh, and then when the need arises after we meet with the families that we reach out to folks on this list uh, to make the match and then we can carry on those conversations. Natalie had a question about, it was mentioned that Ukrainians coming to Canada would not qualify for OHIP to start. Does OHIP become available eventually? Faye, can I pass this question on to you? Yes. Um, so uh, right now we, we don't know, uh, but as far as we know right now, uh, at the start of COVID, the provincial government actually kind of issued a statement that anybody who does not have OHIP can actually walk into like a walk-in clinic or to the hospital and actually receive uh, med like treatment for, for free, which will be covered by the provincial government. So while this um, uh, bill is still in, this statement is still in place, uh, people without OHIP can still receive um, uh, health care without having to pay as of right now. Um, yeah, hope that answers the question. Hey, there's some questions again. That's about OHIP, yeah, about OHIP. Yesterday, my daughter said that her teeth need to <laughs> fix it, for cavity. She had cavity, and um, also she had another teeth coming, and uh, she have to pull up. So how it works? Is, is it possible to get any discount or anything? Um, yeah, so Olina, so uh, we, we are doing the fundraising. So uh, please reach out to us directly and we can have a discussion, you know, to see how much that will cost and um, how we can help with that uh, reimbursement. So please reach out to us and Thank you. Yeah, we'll be happy to help. Yeah. Thank you, Faye. Um, a follow-up question related to health is whether that would cover pregnant mothers going into labor. Um, so, so from my understanding is that, um, yes, if it's, if it's a, um, if it's a service that is being provided by the hospital, it should be covered. My, my suggestion is definitely to speak to the, um, to the fight, to the financial department, just to make it clear what your current, what the current status is, what your current status is, that you don't have OHIP, and if it would be covered. It's always a great idea to to speak to them directly first so that there is no um, surprises or any kind of like a bill that would come to you after. But from my understanding is that I, I could share, I could share what that bill is um, that states that the provincial government is covering and the types of services that will be covered. Thank you, Faye. Um, there was a reminder about updating our communications websites to include all this information. And absolutely, that is something that is on the list to do. Um, as the situation evolves, we're trying to, to work with it as best as we can. So thank you for the reminder to do that, to update our website. Um, a question from Wendy about whether the local settlement workers and schools team speaks Ukrainian. Uh, we don't have um, a settlement worker, uh, settlement worker in schools who speaks Ukrainian. Um, if there is a need for interpretation that arises, uh, we have uh, some volunteers who have stepped up. Uh, we also rely on professional interpretation services uh, in agencies in the event that we are not able to find um, that capacity in our community. Uh, question about where the recording will be on the NCC site. Um, so it'll likely be on the homepage, but if you are registered for this session, uh, the link to the recording will be sent to you as well. So David has shared uh, his information, uh, Safe Haven for Refugees Peterborough, uh, right there on the, um, in the chat. 
Okay, so I believe I've covered, um, I believe I've covered the questions that have come in the chat. Elizabeth, please go ahead. Elizabeth, you've raised your hand. Would you like to go ahead? Sorry, <laughs> I misheard you, Yvonne. Um, am I to understand that the uh, Ukrainians who will be coming to Peterborough um, in the near future will be going to family members? Because I'm concerned about housing and things. Will they have a place to go to? Are they coming to families? Or um, are there people who are coming with no place to live? So, Faye, would you like to answer the question or would you like me to? Um, sure. So, uh, so for what we are aware, um, uh, for the Peterborough families, and um, we do know that um, most of the U Ukrainians who are be arriving have a connected family member here. Um, but we're also aware that in the North Dama area, there is um, um, a community member who is bringing in 15 families. 15 families who do not have a connect a family connection here in Canada. So it, it really is, is, is depending. So th there are different scenarios. Yeah. Okay. So from what we know though, uh, is that um, this community member in uh, Northumberland area is trying to connect uh, these individual families with host families in the area so that they would have a place and house to go to upon arrival. Thank you, Faye. Gloria, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. I'm just, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just wondering um, how I could connect with the Port Hope people. Um, I'm in Coburg and I would like to help with the Port Hope initiative. So how can I get in touch with them? Um, I can, uh, in the PowerPoint, there is a list, um, a link to the GoFundMe campaign that is organized by Olina Hankivsky. So Olina is the one who's connecting the 15 families. So when I send out the PowerPoint, just in case I don't manage to connect with you by email, you can click on that link and connect with Olina um, directly. So she's the one who's organizing the 15 families in Port Hope. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. There's a question in the chat from Tanis. Um, do we know what the documentation looks like that people can use to register their children at school, paper or a stamp in the passport? Faye, are you able to answer that question? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, usually like an open work permit. Um, so if, if the parents are able to kind of show that they are here on, they have that, so the visitor, the visa permit will say that, okay, they are from Ukraine and they have that stamp. So a visitor visa is actually like a counter fall on in their passport. So with that and an open work permit, basically children can uh, register in school. It's really much, pretty much based on what kind of documentation the parents have. So it does say in the government website that, um, uh, that, that children under the age of like 18 actually do not require a study permit to be able to attend school. Thank you, Faye. I've posted in the chat um, the GoFundMe link that has a way for you to con uh, contact Olina Hankivsky in uh, Northumberland. Another question from Hannes, uh, Tannis, no, sorry, from Evan. Uh, is it mostly women and children who are making up the family groups at this time? Um, that is our understanding uh, from the families that, um, the majority of the families that we have been in touch with. We're hearing from Olina um, in Port Hope that there are actually also families that are traveling with children from other families. So they are guardians for children um, whose parents are not able to leave uh, Ukraine at this point in time as well. Uh, a question from, or a comment from Ginny. Ginny emailed our local school and they sent me registration form and verification of citizenship and immigration uh, documentation. Thanks for sharing that, Ginny. Do we have any more questions from the room at this point in time? 
comment from Tanis. We'll be sending out information to our schools in the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board tomorrow to outline registration for children entering through the uh, Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel. Thank you very much, Tanis. Is there anyone else who would like to speak or to ask a question at this point in time? There is not. Um, if there isn't at this point, then what I would do to, to round up the session um, is to invite our um, executive director at the new Canadian Centre, Andy Craig, to offer some closing comments uh, before we wrap up the session for today. Andy, if you're here. You. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, good evening, everyone. As Yvonne said, my name is Andy Craig, and I am the executive director here at the New Canadian Centre. We're currently from the attic of my house, as the case may be. Uh, I just really want to reiterate our thanks for the support that uh, we've heard from the community members uh, that are so keen to help out and be welcoming and provide what they can for folks who are fleeing a difficult situation. We've seen that again and again through our organization with folks coming from many different places in the world, whether that's Syria or Afghanistan or now from Ukraine. And you know, we're so appreciative of the support that's offered, whether that's uh, items or housing or donations to support us. And I just want to say our thanks and as well to thank you to, to Yvonne and Faye uh, for organizing tonight and sharing this information with the community. I think there's a real uh, thirst and appetite for uh, being uh, able to contribute in some way to the folks who are coming. We know that there are many people that will be coming in the coming days and weeks, and I am heartened to know that uh, we are ready and willing and able yet again, both at the New Canadian Centre and in the broader community to help those folks with all that they need. So thank you again, everyone, for coming tonight. Thank you, Andy. Um, this, a couple of comments that came in in the chat. Uh, one about perhaps encouraging our partners to waive the international student fees for any Ukrainian students. So we have actually heard from uh, Trent that has uh, six Ukrainian students right now, um, and also Russian students who are facing uh, financial difficulty at this point in time. So there has been um, a fundraising campaign at Trent to raise money to support the living expenses of the students that are uh, at Trent, um, and also um, removing tuition tuition blocks. But I think passing on those comments that they could do more to support the students uh, would definitely uh, do that. And uh, finally, Taras Peter Patter is interested in establishing a small food production co-op for Ukrainian refugees here in Peterborough as a means of providing them with employment and a familiar community. Also exposing the greater Peterborough community to delicious Ukrainian food. And um, her email address, their email address is listed there, and I will include that in the notes uh, that are going out with uh, the recording. All right, so I think it's time. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your compassion and your support. Um, looking forward to continuing to work with you to make our community uh, welcoming and inclusive. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. <laughs>